The air was dry inside the coach bus. Recirculated a thousand times during our journey to the casino from the retirement home. There was something about getting older that made everything in life feel dehumidified. As if my body were slowly losing the ability to absorb and retain moisture. I hated it. Muriel, do you have a hard candy I can borrow? My throat is parched. The white-haired woman in the seat in front of me turned around, smiling sweetly as she rummaged through her oversized purse. It was full of miscellaneous items, and I was pretty sure a peppermint hard candy would be in there somewhere. Muriel was always good for a fix. Here you go, Harry. You can keep it. She laughed as she handed me a Kleenex wrapped red and white candy. I took it and thanked her, struggling to remove the tissue from it with my dry arthritic fingers. After what felt like hours, I popped it into my mouth. <sighs> I felt better already. The PA system clicked on and a hiss of feedback came out from the speaker above us. We'll be arriving at your destination in just a few moments. Thank you for traveling with Blue Bard Bus Lines and have a wonderful evening at Poseidon's Bounty, said the bus driver's crackling voice. The casino was coming up on our right, and I looked out the window at the huge building with its flashing neon signs. Massive blue tridents flanked the entrance and loomed over us ominously. None of us got out much anymore these days, and I had to admit I was a little nervous. Our large group got off the bus and entered the ocean-themed interior of the casino. There were ladies walking around dressed as mermaids with elaborate jewels and blue hair, carrying trays with drinks on them. Waves were painted on the walls with maritime scenes. Fish tanks were all over the place filled with kelp and colorful aquatic life, ranging from fish to octopus, crab, and other crustaceans. All of us looked around, taking in the scenery as we walked slowly with our canes and rolled forward in wheelchairs, the stronger ones among us, pushing the others in their chairs. Brian was the most able-bodied person in our group. He had played professional football once upon a time, and his stature made that obvious once he told you about it. The frequent head trauma he'd experienced in those days had left him a little bit off. He still wore his bulky gold championship ring on one hand, but he had the shakes now, and had tremendous difficulty pulling the ring from his swollen fingers if you asked to look at it. Brian looked a bit out of place amidst the group of us white and gray-haired geezers, since most of us were twenty years senior to him. But he was smiling and seemed to be enjoying himself as he walked through the brightly lit foyer towards the security desk. Loud voices were speaking from all around, mingling with the sounds of dinging slot machines and whoops of excitement from the gaming tables just ahead. I was already finding it difficult to hear, and we were still near the entrance, nowhere near the gaming floor. Reaching my fingers into my ear, I turned the hearing aid down a couple notches and breathed a sigh of relief as the screeching whine of feedback dissipated. Welcome to Poseidon's Bounty said a large, pallorous man in a black suit at the security desk, making no attempt to stop us. You folks have a wonderful night. Best of luck to you. Aw, you're not going to ask to see my driver's license? Muriel asked, pinching the man's cheek. I'm disappointed. The security officer blushed, waving us through and laughing self-consciously. As the metal detectors went off, nobody said a thing. The walkers, canes, and wheelchairs were expected to cause that. The gaming floor was up ahead, and the group of us went happily towards the bright lights and laughing voices, anxious for the night ahead of us. Who knew what might happen tonight? This place was full of possibilities. It was like being a kid again. With that thought in mind, I reached into Muriel's bag and pulled out my pump shotgun, racking a load into the chamber. This caught a few people's attention, and they gasped and looked up at me. One person scowled, and another shrieked in terror, but most were silently staring at me in shock. I climbed up onto a nearby poker table. My bones creaked and cracked along the way. Once I finally got up there, I blasted the shotgun, firing into the ceiling to catch the attention of anybody who hadn't noticed me. Everybody on the ground, now! This is a stick-up! Don't try to be a hero and you'll live to see tomorrow! Most of the people in the casino were so terrified and shocked by what was happening that they quickly did as they were told, diving to the floor when they saw the gang of us with our weapons drawn. 
Meanwhile, the last few people in our group had incapacitated the guards at the security desk with stun guns and were tying them up, pointing pistols at their heads to ensure compliance. Muriel had pistol-whipped one of them, and blood was trickling from his forehead as he cried like a baby. I heard a loud, wet noise from my right and saw Brian was punching a security guard repeatedly in the face as the man tried to draw his revolver. His nose crunched beneath the big man's fist, crumpling into a flattened slab on his face. The guard spit out a few teeth, and I guess that he swallowed some as well, since they were mostly missing from his mouth when he gasped for air. Brian threw him into a heap on the floor, and all of the nearby guards unclipped their gun belts, letting them drop to the ground. They raised their hands in the air, looking submissive after watching their co-worker get beat to a bloody pulp. Good decision, I said from on top of the table. Now all you put your hands on your heads and get down on the ground. The guards complied, glancing at each other nervously. I looked around the games room to see almost everyone was following suit, except a group of guys in the slot machine section who were looking at us defiantly. They appeared to be in their early 20s, that unfortunate age when you don't stop to consider the consequences before doing something stupid. They were whispering and looked as if they were getting ready to charge us. I already knew what they were up to, but I allowed them to come at us. Secretly, though, I made a hand signal to Robert and Brian, and I saw them disappear into the shadows as the young men approached, looking angry. All right, Gramps, you come down here right now and hand over your guns, he said, reaching into his pocket for something. I racked another round into the shotgun chamber and aimed it square at his head. Keep reaching in your pocket, you're going to end up in worse shape than that guy, I said, my eyes darting towards the security guard Brian had incapacitated. He was still moaning and howling in pain, writhing on the ground, a pool of blood forming around his head on the carpet. This caused the man to hesitate momentarily, as he stopped reaching into his pocket and put his hands in the air. His friends gradually followed suit, looking at each other uncertainly. That's better, I said, just as Brian and Robert came up behind them stealthily, knocking out their knees with their rifle butts and sending them screaming to the floor. Muriel, go see the teller for us, will ya? We need to make a withdrawal. The white-haired woman laughed and blasted a ram into the air with her antique gun, causing ceiling tiles to come crumbling down from above and shattering a light fixture. She reloaded while walking over to the chip counter, pointing the barrel in the face of a young lady working behind the cage. Open up, she screamed, her purse still dangling from one arm, and the door buzzed a second later. I stayed where I was, keeping an eye on the guards at the door. A handful of our gang were soon invading the teller room and filling up their bags with huge volumes of cash. We weren't here for the vault. That was a surefire way to end up dead or in prison. This was a quick in-and-out job. You don't realize who you're robbing, said a man from the floor nearby. Who said that? I demanded, jumping down from the blackjack table. This is a really bad idea. You should all leave right now. Maybe then he won't kill you. There was a man in a black suit looking at me from the ground, his eyes hard and fearless. He was the pit boss, I was pretty sure. The guy who supervises the dealers to make sure they're not stealing, and also watches to make sure the players aren't cheating. You got something to say, asshole? I demanded. Speak up, I can't hear you mostly because I'd turned my hearing aid down. The amphetamines at the center of the peppermint candy I was sucking on were just starting to kick in, and my heart was racing, my hands gripping the shotgun tightly. Damn that Muriel. She upped her game again. This shit is good. Just a friendly word of advice for your group, said the boss. Run now while you still can. Run fast and far. Leave the money behind. And no matter what you do, stay on dry land. For some reason, his words made me nervous. I gulped down a lump in my throat as I thought about it all. We'd researched this place. It didn't belong to the Mafia or to a secret government-funded group. At least, as far as we could tell. And our hacker, my great-grandson, was one of the best in the business. Even if he was still in middle school. He'd know if the owner of this casino was dangerous. Hurry up, Muriel. We might have a problem. The group of them were finishing up and came running out of the teller room carrying huge sacks of cash. There were bills fluttering in the air everywhere and I heard sirens howling in the distance getting closer. What the hell are you worried about, Harry? We can take care of the cops. It was a small town and we had this planned out pretty well. But I was starting to get the feeling we had missed something. Forget it, let's just get out of here. 
We hustled out of the casino as quickly as we could, running with our walkers and sprinting while pushing wheelchairs. When we got outside, I could see the cops approaching in the distance, and I checked my watch. Their response time had been good, but we were ahead of schedule. We'd get out of here with no issues, I was sure of that. The handicapped van pulled up to the curve, and I saw our driver was just on time as usual. Hop in, yelled Wayne, a fat, spit-soaked cigar dangling from his lower lip. He was wearing his usual tan Air Force bomber jacket, stomping on the gas pedal and revving the engine impatiently. We all jumped into the back of the minibus, and the tires screeched on the pavement as we pulled out. The police were only a hundred yards away by the time we pulled out into the road, leaving us just enough room to maneuver and pull off the key part of our plan. The buildings were close on both sides of the road as we raced towards the city limits. All of the cop cars were behind us en route from the police station downtown, and we had nothing but clear roads ahead of us. However, the minibus was slow, and Wayne was having trouble getting up to speed. I looked back in the rearview mirror and saw the cops were gaining on us, their engines roaring loudly as they inched closer from behind. Floor it, Wayne, come on! I am flooring it, this thing is a piece of shit! Wayne screamed, biting the cigar in half as he grit his teeth in frustration. This isn't good, they're getting too close! Muriel said, looking nervous. The alley was coming up on the right, I realized and we would make it just in time. Let's hope their brakes work, I said as we passed the alley and the huge bus began to emerge from it, blocking the road just behind us. Go, go, go! I yelled into the walkie-talkie in my hand. But of course, Jim was already on the ball. His timing was perfect as always. Just after we drove past the alley, the coach bus pulled into the roadway, barricading it completely. Jim had remained on board after we had all gotten off the bus, then carjacked the coach, taking it for our purposes. The driver was tied up in the back. I heard horns honking and brakes screeching on the other side. Then a soft bang as a police car crashed into it with a dull impact. Jim came rushing out the door of the bus and got in the vehicle with us, laughing and whooping. As we drove away, I looked back over my shoulder, seeing the coach was perfectly serving its purpose as a roadblock, not allowing any of the cops to get by. And the best part was... This was the only way in or out of the city, since we had another man blocking the east tunnel with a broken and abandoned tractor trailer. The bridge came into view up ahead, and not a single police car could be seen anywhere. We'd gotten away with everything. Or so we thought. That night we celebrated on Brian's yacht. We were popping champagne bottles and laughing, retelling the story of what had happened to those who had been responsible for our getaway. Jim and Wayne listened intently when I got to the part with the pit boss. I told them how he had started talking from the floor, saying we would regret robbing the place. He told me we didn't know who we were robbing, that we'd regret it, apparently. Wayne just chuckled at that. Maybe he doesn't know who he's dealing with. That elicited a hearty round of laughter from the group as everyone clinked their champagne glasses together, smiling. Oh, and get this. He said to stay on dry land... Whatever that means. Uh, the place we hit a couple months back. You remember that one in Atlantic City? Uh, Neptune's Plunder? The guy there told me the same thing. Don't worry about it, man. I was just trying to get in your head. We know the place isn't Mafia. It's owned by some holding group. Trident Industries. Yeah, I'm sure you guys are right. I said, feeling no better. The memory of the man's words were still ringing in my mind, repeating over and over. I didn't like how confident he had sounded. So sure of himself. I took another sip of the champagne, but it tasted bitter in my mouth. Setting it down on the table, I excused myself and went over to the hors d'oeuvres. I wasn't hungry, but I wanted to get away from the others for a minute. Even though my stomach felt queasy, I realized I should eat, and picked up a plate. The food had been expensive, and there was no sense wasting it. As someone who had lived through the hardships of the Great Depression, to me that was unthinkable. There was sushi and escargot, not to mention a whole arrangement of cocktail shrimp and unagi. Fresh grilled octopus and swordfish. I stood in front of the table trying to pick something out, but couldn't. I felt sick to my stomach more and more looking at the dishes. For a minute I couldn't figure out why. The movements were so subtle. But the longer I stood staring at that table, the more obvious it became. There was something wrong with the seafood. How had nobody noticed it before? The octopus were still writhing, the escargot squirming, 
and the cocktail shrimp staring at me while they flipped their fins. Even the unagi was looking at me suspiciously. I screamed, dropping the plate I had just picked up when I saw the muscles snapping open and closed, moving towards my fingers. The plate shattered loudly on the deck and all conversation stopped. Everyone else came running over and asked me what was wrong. I looked at them, wondering how they couldn't see it. But when I looked back at the table, everything was normal again. I... What just happened? Did you see it? Am I the only one who just saw that? The group kept asking me what had happened, but I was afraid to tell them, so I didn't. I thought they would call me crazy. Maybe if I had been honest about things, everything would have turned out differently. Maybe we would have realized that there was something wrong. Instead, we continued heading further and further out to sea in the blackness of night. The rest of the group insisted I go lay down in my bunk while they continued their celebrations. They said I looked pale and unwell all of a sudden. So that's what I did. I tried to relax, to close my eyes and sleep, but I couldn't. The sounds of the ocean pressing in on the hull around me were too much for my mind to handle. Something about the water was unsettling me, but I didn't understand why. I'd never been afraid of drowning, so why now? Forcing my eyes closed, I told myself to relax. We just pulled off the robbery of the century. We'd robbed Poseidon's bounty. A small but wealthy little casino with plenty of cash on hand. There would be no need to do another job for a long, long... Something broke me out of my thoughts and my eyes snapped open. I bolted upright in the bunk, looking at the confusing sight unfolding in my room. Murky green water was spilling in under the door, filling the room slowly. I jumped out of bed, concerned that the boat was sinking. Running out of the room, through the damp hallway, my feet squishing across the carpets, I began to call out for the others, yelling for them to wake up. But no one came out of their rooms or made a sound, despite the water up to my ankles rushing through the galley. I shouted even louder, thinking maybe they hadn't heard me in their slumber. It occurred to me that everyone could still be up on the deck, preparing a lifeboat. So I hurried even faster, rushing up the stairs until I was outside in the cool night air. The first face I saw was Muriel's. Bloated and purple, her neck being squeezed in the grip of a massive squid tentacle. The reddened imprints of its suckers could be seen running up her arms and down her face, indicating this battle had been going on for a while. But finally it ended, as she collapsed dead and lifeless onto the water-drenched deck beneath her. Retreating back into the water, the tentacle disappeared again. Whatever creature it belonged to, it had to be massive. The well-appointed deck with lavish decorations was trashed, the buffet table broken in half with broken plates everywhere. Sea creatures that should have been cooked and edible were wriggling and alive again, slithering back into the water. Robert was pale and unbreathing. His throat opened up with a gaping wound from which blood poured out. It looked like a shark bite. Jim was on the deck as well, his face bloated and green as if someone had funneled salt water down his gullet until he expired. His belly was swollen to ten times its normal size. It all felt like a dream, and I actually pinched myself to ensure that it wasn't. But the pain in my arm was real where I squeezed my flesh between my fingers, indicating this was, in fact, reality. I stumbled forward in the knee-deep water, seeing that we were sinking. The water was far higher than it should have been, compared to the railing which separated us from it. Before I could even think about getting to a lifeboat, the yacht surged downwards into the depths. It felt as if an enormous hand grabbed us from below and began to pull us under. Everything was dark beneath the waves, impossible to see. I tried to swim upwards, but a force much stronger than me continued to drag me deeper, and I watched as the surface receded further and further into the distance above. I held my breath for as long as I could, desperately trying to resurface, but eventually I realized it was hopeless. The ocean had me, and it would be my grave. Gasping in a breathful of salt water, my lungs filled with pain. More terrified than I'd ever felt in my life, I knew I was about to die. My body tried to breathe the water as if it were air, and it went into shutdown mode as my conscious mind panicked and my eyes darted around with fruitless searching motions. I thrashed and clutched my throat as my heart began to skip beats and pound more weakly without access to oxygen. The dim light began turning to total blackness as life drained from my soul. And then I saw eyes appear out of nowhere. 
They were huge, staring at me with cold, remorseless interest. Numb fear gripped me anew as something came slithering snake-like up my leg, burrowing into my abdomen like a drill. Another slimy tentacle went down my windpipe as I choked, coughing and sputtering against it. But then I felt a trickle of air filling my lungs, pumping them full of oxygen and taking the water away. The slimy thing going down my throat was feeding me air, and another was pumping the water from my stomach. A voice came from all around me, deep and booming. It spoke in the dull tones of underwater sounds, echoing and difficult to understand. But it spoke directly into my mind as well, which made it easier to hear. I am the one who lives beneath the waves. I am the ocean and the misty spray. I call the moon to me, and not the other way around. I am Neptune, Poseidon, great conqueror and god of the sea. And yet, you dare to steal from me? There wasn't much I could say, other than an ocean muffled, I'm sorry, we didn't know. But that didn't make him any happier. Sorry. Not yet you aren't. But you will be. You will be very, very sorry. As it turns out, he was right. I'm now a blackjack dealer at Neptune's Depths, a deep-sea casino where mermaids and mermen come to unwind after a hard day's work. The god of the sea has his kelp creatures feed me a trickle of oxygen and nutrients as I perpetually drown beneath the waves, shuffling and dealing over and over again without a break. There are no labor laws in Poseidon's underwater kingdom, and we are severely understaffed since nobody really wants to work here. But at least I've got my friends with me. The ones who are left, anyways. Wayne is over in the poker section, and we share knowing looks, wishing we could take back our last two jobs. Brian is a pit boss, looking intimidating with his large stature and his barnacle-encrusted blue suit. We're all slowly dying down here, our faces turning blue from a perpetual shortage of oxygen. Our skin is beyond pruny and wrinkled to the point of decay and early rot, and clams and mussels attach themselves to us against our will. We're not allowed to remove them, so saith the sea god Pluto, or whatever his name is. I'd give anything to be back up on that too-dry coach again, heading towards the casino. I'd take out my shotgun and point it at that bus driver's head, and I'd tell him to turn around. And we'd go to Vegas instead. The story you just heard was written by me, and a variation of it previously featured on the Doctor No Sleep podcast and YouTube channel. If you'd like to check out their channel for more content, please check out the description below. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zawal, Cheryl James, Picker Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamacato, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Larry Ann 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Burt Turner, Bajani Espinal, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Carrie Harkonnen, LaDonna Spivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batisse, Lisa and the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, Fabulavore, Raymond Jaggers, and That Darn Fox. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content, You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. I hope you please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. It really does help out a lot. And see you again next time at 4pm Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.